Sadashiva Samanam Bham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmadacharya Varyantam Vande Guru Param Param Ishwaro Guratmeti Murti Veda Vimakine Vyoma Bhaktyakta Dehaya Dakshina Murtiya Namaha Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gocharam Tam Gocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadguru Pranatosnyam Revision to get us on track from the last fortnight. <coughs> So from verse 31 to 34, we will go a little bit faster just to revise because we stopped at verse 34 <clears throat> last fortnight. So verse 31 is, let's read it together. So the jiva, we said, like a worm led by the tide of samsara stream, is pulled out of the strong grip of samsara by God's grace owning to pass punya karma and gets temporary relief. So this is describing the, uh, the process where the jiva owning to their punya karma eventually gets temporary relief from the strong grip of samsara and during this time of rest, they can either inquire the purpose of their life or they can <clears throat> use that freedom to then ask, how can I have more leisure in my life? So this is the test of the jiva. This is the opportunity for the jiva where they get another chance to pursue either Ishwara or to pursue more worldly desire. <clears throat> so and then they switch in and out. Sometimes they will choose Ishwara and then they will go back into the world. So this goes on eternally. So that's why the Jiva has to be very strong and say only God and uh, pursue that to the end. Now, example of God's grace in action. This is whereby the Jiva is pulled out of samsara temporarily. So the crocodile swims to the river bank to find a nice shady picnic spot where it can have its meal without any disturbance. So just imagine a crocodile with um, you know, a picnic bag and the crocodile finds a shady spot under a tree and he wants to have his meal, you know, with the cutlery, the knife and the fork, or you know, if he's an Indian crocodile, then <laughs> just hands. And as the crocodile creeps up the <coughs> sandy bank, and underneath a huge shady tree, as the crocodile is now resting, the crocodile places the fish which it has caught to eat onto the bank. Okay, so the crocodile wants to eat the fish. Now, in this process, the worm, you and me, slides out of the mouth of the crocodile because crocodile has like, you know, pieces of food stuck between our teeth and then this is a worm that just happens to be in the crocodile's mouth. The worm, which is the jiva, slides out of the mouth of the crocodile onto the sand and scurries away into safety, an undreamt of escape. In other words, what it's saying is the worm, which we discussed last fortnight, could not get itself out of the, some, the stronghold of the river of samsara, which is going one way or wherever the tide of samsara is going, according to the age we're in. So, seemingly unrelated circumstance, like the crocodile, doing its own uh, thing, its own little, um, you know, feeding. And in that seemingly unrelated event, the worm is pulled out of the samsara. So this is one example of God's grace. This is why we can never explain those moments which looking back we say, I, I cannot explain this, but it was like divine. It was holy. Right? It is just 
uh, incredible, but we cannot justify it. So this is what God's grace is. Now, what's next? Means of discrimination by the process of pancha viveka or pancha kosha viveka. So before I go to verse 32, today I want to give you a preview. This is our curriculum. Okay, that's 10 pages. Are we going to get through this? I don't know. However, today is a very important session because it is mostly about practice. If you were to ask, how do I actually apply the entire Vedantic scripture into a living day-to-day -day practice using a specific technique, what would that be? Today we'll be providing that technique. So it's going to be a lot of something that you can take for the rest of your life to negate who I am not, therefore to arrive to who I am and thus establish oneself as Atman. Now, verse, verse 32, reading, the jiva, finding oneself in the whirlpool of samsara, having got instructions from the acharya, and who has realized Brahman, that means the Acharya who has realized the truth, by the process of discrimination of the five sheets, Panchakosha Viveka, one attains supreme liberation, Moksha. In other words, the Jiva having gotten out or a temporary relief onto the sandy banks, now pursues, obviously asking him or herself, okay, now that I'm saved, what do I want to do with my life? From that moment, they say, I want to discover happiness. I want to discover contentment, peace that is unchanging. So that causes them to then pursue and find a teacher. So this teacher, which they find, is what's being referred to as the Acharya. And this Acharya then teaches this Jiva the process of discriminating self from not self, which we will actually do today. And as a result of that discrimination through time, in other words, we need patience. In other words, if this doesn't work and we say, this is not working for me, that, that's totally irrelevant because tell me one thing in life that works immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so such things, such matters are irrelevant. We need to persist with anything. And as a result, they attain <clears throat> liberation. When, they, when it says attains liberation, don't think of it as something big. Liberation is the most ordinary, uh, there's nothing extraordinary about liberation. It just means I am. <laughs> That's it. Which we'll also investigate what liberation is because so many angles to uh, look at that topic. Commentaries. The crocodile of the story in the last verse represents the guru, the acharya. The crocodile, in other words, the acharya pulls the disciple out of the whirlpools of life in which he or she is caught. The crocodile then, or the acharya, brings the disciple to the warm sand bank of his or her ashram, that means their place of teaching, where the disciple can recover him or herself and receive the training through patient uh, persistence. Now, what is the purpose of this acharya? Of this teacher who uh, helps the jiva, one who has a thorough understanding of the scriptures, who makes the student firmly walk the true path, by walking that path, him or herself being rooted in dharma, we call such a person a acharya or guru. This means an acharya is not someone who just uh, is a scholarly person, they're also firmly established, they're living the truth themselves, they're established in Dharma. Otherwise, it's going to come across and people are just not going to, they're going to pick it up and they'll say, it's not a teacher. The Acharya cannot say that he or she is beyond Dharma and Adharma, important statement. In a spiritual world, we will often find some uh, teacher <laughs> goes, I am beyond all this. <laughs> I am beyond Dharma, I can do whatever I want. No, this is um, a thinking that is not full, it's partial thinking. Because in reference to the world from which that Acharya is saying that statement, they also have to comply with Dharma. Because the Acharya has students and therefore they represent, they 
how do children learn? By example. By example. In other words, adults are exactly the same. So if the Acharya breaks a, a vow or does something and then gets discovered, then that actually disappoints everyone. So it's actually doing a lot of damage. So therefore, the Acharya has a lot of uh, responsibility. Otherwise, it's just Papa Karma on there and they, they get in trouble. Okay. Now, what's next? The Koshas, the five sheets are named. So before we begin the investigation of the discrimination, we need to first get a general idea what the five courses are. And the purpose of this teaching, you're asking, why should I do this? What's the point? How will I benefit? The benefit is to move the attention from who I am not, that is the strong pull of samsara, onto who I am. I'll give you an example. Everyone at some point in life has someone that we have tension with. <laughs> okay. Now, why, now, why do we now why do we relate with such a question? The question, the answer is because we're not doing discrimination. We're giving reality onto one of these five cautious, which is being agitated by the presence of this other individual, and then we identify with that kosha, and then we say. I feel agitated. So therefore you can see the usefulness of negation through this process. We're not just you know here to sort of okay tell me and then I'll go home. There's a real purpose to it. Verse 33 revision. Okay now we're gonna name the five koshas. We're still revising from the last fortnight so you haven't missed anything. Okay verse the food, that means Anamaya Kosha, vital air, name please. Anamaya Kosha, mind, yeah, intellect, yeah, Anamaya or Bhuti, and bliss, Anamaya Kosha. There's a long A, Anamaya. Okay, and so these five Koshas are covered, covered by them. The Atman, that means the self, awareness, when I say Atman, I mean awareness, that is aware of these words now, forgets its own essential nature, thus is subjected to the cycle of birth and death. In other words, what it's saying is, the I, I am, give reality to one of the worlds or one of the five sheets. And as a result of that focus, I make myself one of these limited five sheets. Therefore, I end up being a limited individual and anything that is limited gets reborn. Commentary. After the covering have taken charge of the Atma or have seemingly superimposed themselves over the self, the Atman gets identified with them. Stop there. Remember the question that I posed? Does someone have any tension? That answers the statement. In other words, what has taken charge? One of the five sheets. Thus, I have tension with someone at some place at some time. And this leads the <clears throat> leading the Jivatma. Jivatma means the person, the BMI, body, mind, intellect, who believes or thinks they are the body, mind, intellect, but they're actually Atman. So the Jivat, so Jivatma means in one word, ignorant, ignorant person. Okay, ignorant person is not pointing anyone down. It just means I have not taken the time to listen and to inquire. Therefore, I don't know who I am. So Jivatma, and then one's own essential nature is forgotten as a result of this superimposition. Okay, stop there. For example. When we were young, you will remember, at some point we got very angry at someone. In that moment of anger, we weren't thinking straight. In other words, in that moment of extreme tension or anger, there was a certain covering that was operating. And as a result of that presence of that covering, we forgot about the aspect of rationale or aspect of consideration. So this is the same case with the five sheets. When we're covered, we unconsciously identify with the five sheets. 
Thereafter, the story of birth and death starts. So this means every one of us here is alive. What does this mean? We did not follow verse 32 all the way to verse 40 something. Okay, we did not do uh, discrimination. And the, the release from this vicious cycle can only come if the jiva sheds its identification with the cautious by this word should become the favorite of ours, rejecting them. Now, please note, rejecting and denying are two different words. Denial means I am denying it on the basis of escape because I'm uncomfortable to feel it right now. I'm unwilling to accept and own the responsibility of having the emotion be present in this body and this mind. Rejecting means on the basis of understanding the nature of this emotion or the thought, that is, it's being just a passing moment, a triguna. On the basis of that understanding, I can reject it. Because, going back to my question, do you have tension with anyone in your life? The, the answer is yes. Then what do we do? How do we finally end that? Not by denying it, because denial, there's a phrase that says, whatever you persist, <coughs> resists. Whatever you resist, persists. In other words, if I resist an emotion or someone that I don't like, I put them, deny them, then every time they come at some point in my life, they're going to reenact those same quantity and qualities of negative emotions. Okay, so rejecting simply means I'm witnessing this as it is objectively, and on the basis of that, I can say, this is another passing object known to me, thus it is not me. Which we will now get into more detail as to how to do this. <clears throat> okay, now... Can I ask about that word, rejecting? Yep. If that <coughs> word seems a bit emotional to me, like a rejecting that's pushing it away, perhaps yeah. a less emotional one would be negating. <coughs> yeah, I was going to also th I recommend to you negating. Um, see, this is the thing with words. So you can either reject or deny. I have no problem with either words. Right. But negating certainly has a less emotional uh, connotation to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, uh, you will hear this often, where people keep speaking about their tensions in life, their problems in life. Why? Because there's a re-identification with the Vijnana Maya Kosha or the Mano Maya Kosha, the feeler of emotions. So therefore, they're not doing the practice. Okay. Verse 34, revision, again, from last for, fortnight. Actually, what's coming next? The Anamaya Kosha, that is the gross body, and the vital air, the uh, Prana Maya Kosha. Verse... The gross body, your gross body now, which is most tamasic of all the three gunas, made up of the grossified elements. What is grossified elements? Tan matras undergoing a process through panchikarana. I spoke about the formula. Okay. The gross body made up of the grossified elements. This is on the when I say that because I'm probably going what's the panchikarana and all that. I put it on the website, just so you know. The gross body made up of the grossified elements is called the Anamaya Kosha, the food sheath. The Pranamaya Kosha is the result of Raja Guna, aspect of the subtle body. The subtle body means, in one word, your mind. Okay? Your mind, that means your, uh, our uh, intellect and our emotions. And the pranamaya kosha consists of the karma indriya, the five organs of action, and also the five pranas. Okay, the five organs of action, we spoke about um, your, here, here they are. The, can we see it from here? Speech, so an organ of action. So in order to communicate, I need to use speech. Uh, we've got hands, we've got feet, we've got uh, reproduction organs. So all of these organs are used to interact with the world. So summary, what is five organs of action? Yeah, those organs which interface, which interact, which engage with the world. Therefore, transactions get done. We fulfill our karma, punya and papa. Now commentary, more explanation, just in case the verse wasn't understood. 
what is the Anamaya Kosha? Remember, five koshas. The first one, now we're on gross kosha, the Anamaya Kosha. Consists of the gross body, which is born of the grossified five elements. In other words, your physical body is made up of space, water, air. Actually, we already know that. How is your body earth? Tell me. Okay, wh why is your body earth? Wh what's earth? But I, <laughs> yes? but I, or the soil. It's where food comes out of, and that's how we consume the food. Yeah, food. food. So, so earth is just, uh, so the food that we eat is earth, and that's what we eat. Yeah. So we're earth. Now, how is your body water? Because 70% yes. water and... Yeah, easy, right? Yeah. We're drinking this blood, you we know, flowing everywhere. Water and we have a lot of liquids in Yeah, how is your body fire? You have like fire now? How do you digest food? Yes. Yes. Carbon and yes. body temperature. Perspiration? There's heat. Perspiration, yes. Right? Yes. So heat means fire. It doesn't mean like physical fire, it's just an aspect of fire, which is heat. How is our body air? You breathe in air like air. Yes. Flow with oxygen through the organs, through the veins. How is our body space? Oh, space. Okay, and there's space in our stomach. Yes. Okay, so in other words, our bodies have all five elements. Understood now? Okay, that's why it says Anamaya Kosha consists of five, five elements. elements. Now, next. The Pranamaya Kosha is made up of the Rajoguna aspect of the subtle body, namely the Karma. That means the five organs of action and the five pranas. Now the five pra we know the five organs of action already. Now the five pranas we discussed. First one is prana, that means respiration, the ability to take in oxygen, to inhale and exhale. Apana, excretion, to excrete uh, foods. Dhyana, circulation, to circulate not only the oxygen, but also to keep the body in like blood pressure and so on. Samana, digestion, that means we need to extract the proteins, the nutrients out of the food and then send them through the body. How? Through Vyana. So you can see how they interact. Samana, digest, Vyana, circulates, and Apana excretes what I have ingested. And Udana is the reverse effect, that means of throwing up, or also at the time of death, uh, your Udana is full, full gear to expel the subtle body out of the gross body. Okay, now what's next? Now we're gonna to begin today's session, verse 35, in detail. Mind, manomaya, intellect sheath, that is Vijnana Maya defined. Before we go forward, define an Anamaya Kosha in one word. Anamaya Kosha? Physical body. Pranamaya Kosha? Gross body. Yeah. No, no, no. The prana my kosha. Oh, it is the gross body. But it's circulation, the life force that keeps the body alive. Okay, good. Now, verse thirty-five. Mind and intellect sheet. Question: What is the mind and intellect sheet? Why are we doing this? Because we need to discriminate this as not I. So, verse thirty-five. The doubting mind. Should I come here today on a Sunday or not? That was your mind. And the five sensory organs the jnana indriyas, that is the five organs of perception, you're looking at this board, that means sight. organ of sight, yeah. Which are the effect of sattva guna, that means knowledge, that's why they can receive data, they can receive knowledge, that's why they're of the sattva guna. Make up the mind sheath, the manomaya kosha. The determining decisive intellect, that means should I come here today? Yes, that was from mind to intellect. The intellect alongside the five sensory organs make up the intellect sheath. Okay, now let's explain each one of them. Let's first do mind. The mind that is always doubting, should I get married or not? <laughs> Mindful affirmation. Thinking confused along with the five uh, so it's uh, it's think it's confused and it's doubting constitutes the mind. That means it's confused and doubts. I'm confused. I, I don't know what you're talking about. What's in operation? The mind. 
I want to learn a new skill, can't figure it out. What's in operation? The mind, which means what? The intellect hasn't still grasped the full uh, aspect of the knowledge. And the mind is sustained by our likes and dislikes. Why? Because the mind is nothing but emotion. When there's something that we like, then what happens? There is um, a motivation. There's a motivation there. There's a feeling of I want. Therefore, I want. I don't want is given reality to by some skaras or vasanas or tendencies. I like X, Y, Z. Whatever you like, that is what the mind. I don't like. That is. The mind. Mind. In other words, if you look at Facebook, there's two buttons, like and dislike, that actually just re-exercises, reinforces the identification with what? Manoma kosher. So I'm just pointing this out to see how something so innocent can help us, how it helps us sustain our ignorance. I could now, the Vijnana Mayakosha, that means the intellect. Now, what is the intellect? It's the decisive function of the inner instrument. In the instrument is the subtle body. I describe a subtle body it consists of your mind and intellect. So just think of a subtle body like a container that stores your intellect and the individual's mind. And it is sustained by the power to reason. That's why the intellect is always rationalizing. It's always this deciding, calculating, analyzing. It is decision-oriented and responsible for making a firm decision. So this means those who are not moving in life, like young children, why are they not moving forward? Still held by the grips of the mind. That means the Vijnana Maya Kosha has not been exercised well. So this, we can stop and say, you can see the importance of developing the intellect. How? Sanskrit, learn a new language, new, learn a new skill. Why? Because the more we learn something, the more we exercise our intellect, the more this power of reason is able to then grasp the hold of the mind. Today, all of, most of the um, violence happens because why? The mind is operational and it doesn't have the full control of the intellect. So it's not just about being intellectual. There's an aspect of it of owning because the intellect is a higher personality than the mind now what's the difference between the mind and the intellect answer we discussed Dis discrimination. 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 discrimination yeah uh, mind is a pendulum and intellect stops the pendulum and says we know enough we can now make a decision and we can move forward so if one's in a state of a constant, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, make up your mind, I don't know, make up your mind. This means their intellect is still not grasping the situation, it's not operational. Okay, now suppose one sees a rope. The doubting mind says, it is, is it a snake or a rope? That's the mind, because it's not sure. This is sankalpa, that means determining. So the mind is the determining aspect of our experience. I'm determining, should I, should I not? Is it true or is it false? Should I believe them or should I not? Should I go or should I stay? I'm determining. Upon closer examination on the facts that we have received, the decisive intellect says, yes, indeed. Based on the memory, based on the data that we have received, it is a rope. This is the kalpa, determined. So therefore, mind equals Determining, intellect equals determined. Okay. Determining is endless. Determined is fixed. <clears throat> now next. One point to understand is the mind and the intellect are not two distinct entities. We often think, we often separate mm. the minds over there. So it's different from the intellect. It is just to help us to divide our, to analyze our experience and then to bring it together. How so? It says here, they are the same function in two different stages. Stage one, mind, which is what? Determining. Stage two is determined. So this means they are actually one and the same. 
but they just serve a different function. Because you can't just constantly determine things. We need to think about it. Should, like, I can't just cross the road. I need to, is it safe? So that I need the mind. And then if it's safe, then the intellect comes in. So they're one and the same, but we use the distinction. Do, do you think it is important to say if something is uh, Manamaya Kosha or Vijnanya Maya Kosha? Is that distinction helpful? Or can we just say, oh, it's one of those two, it's one of those two? No, the distinction is absolutely crucial. Because Manomaya Kosha is always related to emotions. Like skepticism, or unsure, or empathy, or compassion, or love even. Or anything that you can use with the word emotion, like I feel something right now. Even uncertainty is an emotion. That is Manomaya Kosha. Okay, anything that you feel. I feel good today because of the weather. That is Manomaya Kosha. And the Jnana Maya Kosha is constant thinking about anything, including, including your life, including your own self. That's also the Jnana Maya Kosha. So you can see how thinking can seem like it's like a bit of a pendulum sometimes. Thinking, thinking is a pendulum because the mind it has to still made a firm decision. Yeah. yeah, but you could be thinking about some very high ideas or concepts. Yeah. And that would be intellect. Would it? That would be intellect, yeah. Because it's not, because you're not trying to decide anything, you're just trying to. It's not. Facts, really. Huh? You're trying to certain facts or things. You're trying to draw data. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You can call that there is an aspect of doubt there, of course. Yeah. But it's doubt and intellect working together. Right? Which is in, reconciliation. Yeah, in order to bring in order to bring it to a like a final resolution, I need to have what both doubt and intellect. They need to work together. Otherwise, what happens if the intellect comes in? Then we make a conclusion too fast, too quickly. That's called stubbornness. That means I was unwilling to uh, doubt. I was unwilling to be <coughs> uncertain so that I can look at it from a different angle. So stubbornness is usually identified, a person identified a lot with their intellect. They're unwilling to change. They're constantly making determined decisions on the basis of their own memories. I made this before, therefore I make it now, and that's all there is to it. And it's not a quality for growth. It's not a conducive quality. Otherwise, uh, what is dharma? That will be decided by you. Dharma. Dharma. What is right, what is wrong? Dharma, yeah, so in other words, the intellect on the basis of what it has uh, also received from the past, then the mind will then judge whether this is right or wrong by consulting the intellect. Because the intellect is what consults the memory. And also the intellect draws from the memory, has this been correct before, and then it analyzes, okay, have I been hurt before? Have, I, have there been any negative feelings before? Okay, if not, then I can send the message to the mind that it can stop oscillating left and right. It is indeed safe to apply. It is indeed safe to uh, you know, smile to someone. <laughs> <laughs> Except we don't think like this. This happens very quickly. So Dharma is... Okay, not, good point. Suppose someone like a child, like a naughty teenager, you know, there's still hormones, um, and they're doing something that's inconsiderate. And they don't quite sure, you know, should I, is this, is this appropriate or is this not? So they're in that intellect, they're in that mind of oscillation. And then when they finally come to a conclusion and say, I think I can get away with it, you know, <laughs> then the intellect jumps in. Or sometimes they'll say, ah, it's not, it's, it's not going to be a good uh, consequence, so I'm going to say no. So even Dharma requires both the mind and the intellect. Now, what is the relationship between the mind and intellect? See, what we're doing is we're training, we're getting to know ourselves, how we think, so we can say that this is not me. The mind is said to be an instrument, the Manomaya Kosha. What is an instrument? Just think of a mind as like a, a container where all the experiences come. For example, right now, that sound had to go somewhere. And also the visuals of this entire room had to go somewhere. 
and also the smell of the jasmine has to go somewhere. So all of these five senses have to go into some house. And from this house, then what happens? The Vijnana Maya Kosha uses that data that it has received, that it's constantly receiving, to make a decision. So you can think of a house and all these experiences are floating around in your mind, like aroma there, you know, here's the wall, there's this person speaking, there is um, the projector sound, all of this is floating around. And the mind simply just organizes that, takes the data and see, what should I do with this? What does this mean? Is this appropriate? Is this inappropriate? So the intellect is constantly uh, judging the data. And what happens is because it's judging, because it's, as, because it's determining this data in the mind, it then becomes a doer. Fundamental problem that keeps the person ignorant. In other words, the Vijnana Maya Kosha now being the doer, being the decider of this experience in the house, the ego also resides in the intellect. So where is this ahamkara? You see how we put it aside? It is actually residing in the intellect. This is why if you ever met a person of a certain uh, nature and they're highly intellectual, you can instantly pick that up. Right? This, 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 there's a sort of a closure about it. It's highly statistical, highly data oriented. So, and it's like, yeah, they, they, they're that. And that's who they are. So this is, that means the ego is identified with the intellect, what it knows and what it doesn't know. This is why we say, oh, I don't know. I'm just a nobody. You know, I don't know anything, so I'm not worth it. So what is this? Whatever is in the intellect or lack of in the intellect, then the ego owns that experience. And then I say, I don't know or I know. So what is this I that I just said? That's the ego, ahankara. Now, the intellect lends support and gives shelter to the feeling, I am a doer. Right now, we're all looking at this board. And we're saying what? I am looking. So this board is data in our minds. And now, this data, we say, hmm, yeah, I see this body, I'm looking. Okay, so that means I become a doer. Now, the intellect, what ha so what has to be done is, is to capture this ego, this fundamental problem of ignorance that causes endless cycles of rebirth. We need to storm the citadel of the intellect. In other words, we need to... So what it's saying is, this is why liberation works on the basis of knowledge because what is being educated right now in this class the intellect and the intellect is what sto stores or protects the ego so therefore how does one reduce this sense of ego or this sense of um, I am a door I am the enjoyer by training the intellect that by removing those notions not training, but removing the notions that I am not the intellect, I am not the doer. How do we do this? We will get into the next verse. What's next? Ananda Maya Kosha. Now, the bliss sheath, okay? A causal body. Anything that makes us do what we do, that makes us, um, all of our habits and the way we conduct ourselves in the world through, with other people, with with situations, all of our habits, tendencies to do certain things, sports that we like, all of that is coming from our tendencies, that means from our causal body. Okay, verse. The causal body that is impure sattva, impure sattva means what? Sattva means Raja and Buddha. Contaminated by Raja and uh, Tamaguna. <clears throat> so the causal body associated with different degrees of joy such as moda, priya, pramoda, in other words, attaining, seeing, attaining and enjoying. Now stop there. 
every single person's experience in, in the world is through the process of I first see how through my perception, either through hearing, either through eyes, through smelling, and that. So the first joy comes where? Just by seeing something. Seeing doesn't just mean visual, but it means any five senses. So step one, joy by seeing. So where does that joy come from? Causal body. Now, greater joy comes how? By attaining what I'm seeing. In other words, I saw something pretty, and I got really excited. Now, having gotten it, there is even more excitement. Is this our experience? So in other words, attaining is always greater than seeing. And finally, enjoying. In other words, reveling in the experience. For example, a kid sees ice cream. Joy number one. A kid is now a convinced mommy and daddy that the ice cream is worth it. <laughs> so. The ice cream is now in the hand. That's, that means the kid has attained the ice cream. Joy number two. And joy number three, lick. That means greater, you know, that's infinite. Actually, it's not infinite, it's finite. But... <laughs> now, that, those three joys that we all experience is the Anandamaya Kosha. So this means any kind of joy you have towards your wife, husband, anyone, children, all of that joy comes from where? Ananda Mike. Why am I saying this? Because we will be discriminating this as not I. See, these, this is how samsara tricks us. Oh, I love life. You know, it's so, it's, it's worth living for my children and my um, family. But even that ends up trapping us. I'm not saying I don't love anyone. <laughs> Just recognize it as it is another object known to me. We, we will get into that. When self, Atma, identifies with individual sheets, that means when the true you, who you are, when that identifies with one of these five sheets, what happens? It takes on the attributes of the sheath which it has identified with. For example, if you identify with your body, what do you say? I am fat, I am thin, I am small, I am... Uh, healthy, I am, uh, well actually not healthy because that's more like the pranamaya. I am, uh, I've got a big nose, I've got a small nose, I've got, you know, um, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. Anything physical or anything even like organs that are not functioning very well, then you say, oh, you know, my uh, tooth. My tooth is sore, therefore I am sore. So in other words, whatever I identify with, anamaya portion. Oh, there we go. I'm old. I haven't, I haven't mentioned that. I'm old and I'm tall and I'm short. Yeah. Or I'm young. Yes, kid. Any, huh? I am kid. I am old. Yeah, yeah. I missed that. Everyone's got that problem? They, they, when they were young, they say, I'm too young. And when they get old, they say, I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> and prana maya kosha. I'm hungry because that's the one of the five pranas. Or um, I feel sick. I've got a high blood pressure. All of that, circulation related, digestion, all of that prana. That means I've identified and taken out and became one of the koshas. Now, let's uh, see what Ananda Maya Kosha <coughs> Okay, we talked about this. So it's just saying here that avidya, because, ana, because the causal body is made out of ignorance, right? When we sleep, there's just blankness, nothing. <clears throat> so it says that avidya is not a problem. So being ignorant is not a problem at all. It only becomes a problem when these three um, thoughts come into action. So for example, because priya, moda, and pramoda, <coughs> if you think about it, this actually drives the entire world of commercialism. For example, you know, we see um, the joy of seeing the object of one's desire. I want a house. So now they go and, uh, you know, cut off trees, right? They, they need to get new land. So because they're under the influence of Priya. So you can see how Priya already destroys the environment. And then Moda, the joy born of obtaining the object of one's desire. In other words, now I finally got her, I finally got him. 
that's, <coughs> that's more that in operation. And then when we get to interact, be close with that object, then the greatest joy happens is pramoda, the joy born of experiencing the object of one's desire. What's the problem with the last one? It creates jealousy, it creates fear of loss, it creates all sorts of emotional dependences and attachments, which then what? Remove the ability to think, to discriminate, because when the emotion is high, intellect is low. When intellect is high, emotion is low. You notice from your own experience, when we fall in love, we're just totally blinded by that person. But then when when honeymoon is over, we start to, oh, is it the right decision? And you know, we start to see a little bit more about our decision because the intellect is coming back. Now let's discover how, this is the more practical aspect of how, what happens when we identify with each of these five quotients. Now the gross body. What happens when we identify with a gross body? We say, I am dark, I am light, I am lean, I am fat. Okay, we can all relate to this. We all say this to ourselves at some point. Yeah? This means that we have identified with who I am not. In that moment, I chose to be ignorant of my nature. I have back pain. I cannot sit down. I cannot bend. In the, or I am very, uh, uh, very flexible, you know, in the, the world of like martial arts. In these ways, we are identified with the body. We may think and say, I am not the body, but such statements we may say I'm not the body but such statements believe I think believe believe it doesn't make sense lie what's a lie of like a lie of like a real situation with a girl twist the truth huh? twist the truth the one is twist the truth okay so in other words such statements cover our real situation with regard to the body the last it doesn't it doesn't really matter this last name is not really that yeah it makes sense yeah it doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. okay you know, I get enlightened by reading the last thing. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, now next. So we all clear what happens when we identify with the body. Anything features, any feature things related to what we can detect in our own bodies that is, in that moment, choosing to be ignorant. Prana, Maya, Kosha, next. My energy levels are not so good today. I feel sleepy today. I'm fatigued. I'm very energized. I feel very strong. I feel like I'm falling apart. I feel nauseous. I want to vomit on everyone. I have constipation. <laughs> All these statements. Oh, my blood pressure, my BP, not the petrol uh, company. <laughs> my BP has shot up. Okay, so all these statements indicate identification with our prana, with our life force in our body. So therefore, in that moment, when we speak like this, we are ignorant of who we are. In other words, we have just decided to continue being ignorant. I decided to be reborn on earth again. Next one, Manomai Khoshe, the mind. For example, I, I am angry or irritated. Okay, so as I said, the mind is the, the feeler of emotions. Whatever we feel, um, then it's going to uh, come through. Like I feel lustful for something, someone. Um, gr there's greediness, I want more. My neighbors got more, therefore I feel like I need to be at their level. Someone's more beautiful than I am, therefore um, I have jealousy. Um, there is nervousness, nervousness, there is a lack of self-esteem, there is uh, just appreciation even, the good, uh, good feelings, there is uh, acceptance. But how is that, you know, uh, something to discriminate? It is, because it's still a feeling of appreciation. It's still not you. You are the awareness of acceptance, awareness of appreciation. Once the thoughts of this type arise, we get trapped by the mind to the exclusion of all 
or to the exclusion of who we are. So in other words, if you think about someone that there's a tension as opposed to that question on the beginning, in that moment, I am choosing to be ignorant of who I am. I am incarnating inside a thought again. I am saying this, even though I am infinite Brahman, I choose in that moment to become a limited small thought called tension with brother, sister, in-law, cousin, auntie, sister, mom, dad, etc. So is it really worth it? Then you decide it on your own. So we, as a result of this identification, we become total slaves and say, this is me. And then we want to get rid of that. So once we identify with anger, our whole body reacts to the feeling. And then our be eyes become flushed. There's contraction in the stomach. Um, ears go red. Um, there's, uh, the throat contracts. Okay, all of these feelings, and I know you know what I'm talking about because we all had them. So this is a result of what? Identification with the mind. So all as a result of this identification, all misconduct in the world happens as a result of mind identification. Identify with emotions of jealousy. So what do we do? You see some movies, how far some people will go when they're jealous of someone else, they will like do, you know, all the way. So this is, um, I am the mind's emotions. Now next, Vijnana Mayakosha, our intellect. This sheath concerns all our analyzing and reasoning. So if you're the kind of person that likes to analyze a engineer, a technician, a thinker, then there's a strong identification with Vijnana Maya Kosha. All our beliefs to which we... Okay, another one. All our beliefs, strong word, everything that I believe and don't believe, value and don't value, all of that belongs to the intellect. And for example, we say, I'm a Democrat, you know, in America. That's why they always, when they vote, you know, we're Democrats. And how far do they go to get to get the president who's a Democrat, who supports democracy? And then how far do they go to get a president who is, you know, who supports, uh, for them to say or enjoy saying, I am a Republican. So, in other words, whenever we make statements about who we are, I am a doctor, I am an engineer, a scientist, I am a parent. I am a son, a daughter, I am a teacher, I am a student. All of this, I'm choosing to be ignorant in that moment and identify with the thought of who I am. Thus, we are incarnating as a thought again. Furthermore, when we say, aha, I have understood, Andre, what you're saying, what just happened, identified with the intellect. Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. Can you expl explain again? What happened? Identify with the intellect. Or I've now concluded what this is all about. I know I, I, I've got. I know who I am now. What are we identifying with? <laughs> <laughs> the intellect, which has now gotten the knowledge. In other words, still I've chose to be ignorant. Even if I say I know who I am, I'm still ignorant. I think you're right. You know, I think you're right. Identify with the intellect. Yeah, you're wrong. You're, everyone's wrong. Identify with the intellect. So what do all arguments come as a result of? Identification with the intellect. So all religious wars come as a result of who's right, who's wrong. Thus, intellectual um, and also emotional in the religious um, drama. While I am confused or I have a doubt, that belongs to the mind. So whenever you say I'm confused about anything or any topic, anywhere, any place, any time, mind. So are you being to see how important this is? So this means even when you say I'm confused, you say what? You reject, you negate as not I. I've understood. I reject, I negate as not I. 
there's some tension with that person. I feel, um, you know, sick. I feel like uh, nauseous. I feel disempowered speaking to mom, dad, X, Y, Z, not I. But see how it's not, it's not easy, is it? Because we get so easily trapped and then we give reality to one of these koshas and then we decide to be ignorant. Furthermore, the Anandamaya kosha, which is a common experience uh, when we say, I slept soundly. I slept very good. I had a very good sleep. Instantly, you have identified with the causal body, not I. Once again, I chose to be ignorant in that moment. In the same manner, for example, seeing the sun, like the sunlight, may bring great joy to a poet. And as a result of this joy, this poet gets into an inspired state and writes beautiful poetry about it. So what does this mean? A lot of the novels and literature that we have today in the bookshelves, number one New York Times bestseller, as a result of some character identified with an idea, that means with their intellect, has now written a book and is now causing other people to read that book. Or being in the presence of one's beloved, we may bring happiness or joy to another. <clears throat> in other words, being uh, with our wife or husband makes us happy, secure, comfortable. Again, identification with that equals I'm choosing to be ignorant as infinite Brahman in that moment. Because I'm giving reality that this joy is what I need for my fullness. So this is where now the practical aspect will come in uh, furthermore to see how to apply this. Okay, the basis of this is if we can strip ourselves of all the above experiences by becoming aware as they arise, becoming aware as they arise, again, becoming aware, repeat, Becoming aware as they arise in the where in the Anamaya Kosha, there's pain in the body. I become aware as it arises. There's a thought, there's an emotion. I become aware as it arises. Then we can have the ultimate or we get to enjoy our ultimate reality as we are. How? By being a witness to them all. In other words, this is an instruction how to actually perform negation and thus reclaim our infinite nature as fullness. And furthermore, what does this being aware as they arise mean? That means being a witness, that means the awareness of whatever is going on. We simply are standing apart as an observer to them. This is called objectivity. So this means, I asked the question at the beginning, is there any tension with anyone in your family? Don't answer. From now, as a result of this going through this session, what are we, how is our attitude now going to change? Think about it. Because this is where it comes down to practicality. How is from now on, today on, when we walk out, how is our attitude going to be different as a result of seeing this? <clears throat> That's for you to think about. You don't even have to answer it. That means we are observing without getting involved. So here's a quick formula. Bondage, that's why we're here again uh, from endless amount of times, equals self plus five sheets equals jiva. So who we are right now is from the jiva aspect, from the, phys from the aspect of mitya, jiva equals Atman plus five sheets. Jiva minus five sheets equals self. That is why we need to negate. Because the only reason we get to be a Jiva over and over and over again is because I get to resubscribe, resupport one of the functions, one of the experiences occurring in one of these five koshas. 
Okay, and also the last one is quite uh, useful. Identification happens at the intellectual level because of ignorance, because it doesn't know, we don't know who we are. In other words, all identification happens in the intellect. Why? Because the intellect is not educated who we are. Thus, it has no choice but to grasp on to whatever is happening in our entire uh, five bodies. Therefore, the solution, the only solution to moksha lies where? In the knowledge, which is what Vedanta is about. That's why we're coming, you know, the classes. Liberation is possible through correct knowledge, not through, you know, a bunch of asanas, through a bunch of meditation, trying to experience Nirvikalpa Samadhi, going back to Vipassana retreats longer and longer and all that stuff, even though that purifies the mind. But the ultimate solution is in the knowledge. What, what do we need to do? Wrong identifications, wrong notions about who we are need to be removed. Not about learning who you are. Why, why, why do you, don't you have to learn who you are? You can't. No, you grasp what you are. Yeah, you already are who you are. You can't become who you already are, who you never were other than who you already are right now. So in other words, we're not trying to discover, we're not trying to learn, like, yeah, give me some knowledge who I am. We're trying to remove notions which prevent us from the appreciation of us as eternal, as immortal beings, as immortal um, self. In other words, the flaw lies in the intellect. The intellect needs to be treated with correct knowledge. So therefore the injection to ignorance is self-knowledge. That's, that's why Vedanta works, because it's an injection for, uh, for yeah. that substance which destroys ignorance. Now, what's next? How does does one how does a seeker separate the atma from the clutches of the five sheets? Furthermore, we go into the technique now. Preparation. Okay, we need to two important wor wor uh, words. What we're going to do is a process called uh, anvaya vyatireka. Anvaya means essential. So when we say the word anvaya, it means essential. essential. When we say Vyatireka, it means it is not necessary. It is non-essential. Example, if I have a pearl neck necklace and I remove the pearls, then what, be what becomes the essential? The actual thread. Yeah. What becomes non-essential? The pearls. So in other words, the pearls become Vyatireka. Anvaya becomes the actual thread, the necklace. So in other words, what is non-essential in the pearl necklace? Pearls. The pearls. pearls. Is it pearls or pearls? pearls. Yeah, pearls, pearls, right? So the pearls are gyatireka. They're non-essential, but what's essential? The actual thread which joins them together. Why are pearls essential? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a pearl necklace. You can say a necklace. What is essential in a necklace? Yeah. It's the strings in the knot. What's the strings? Yeah, okay. So, in terms of, I, I thought you said a pearl necklace. No, it's a necklace. necklace. Yeah. Well, I can understand what you're saying because the value of the pearl necklace is a pearl, not the thread, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even though the thread no, is the I'm one that gives the value to the pearl necklace. <laughs> no, so I can understand your value for what the is the pearl necklace? What is a pearl necklace? Well, it is pearls. And because if they're most the pearls, therefore we get to enjoy the pearl necklace because of the thread. Yeah. Okay. okay, how about this? If you take away the thread from the pearl necklace, do you have a pearl necklace? Do you have anything at all? <laughs> it has nothing to say. It has nothing to say. <laughs> at necklace. <laughs> no necklace. Like both need each other. Like it's a both inseparable kind. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. If you take away the pearls, you still have something. You still have a substratum which supports the content upon which you can actually say a pearl necklace and get to enjoy it. If you take out the thread, there's nothing to say because there's no substratum. There's no holding aspect. And the glue. Jesus, simple example. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So anvaya, please remember, it means essential, uh, and vyatireka uh, means not essential. Now, verse 37. Anvaya vyatireka, technique of discriminating the five sheets. This is the actual technique. By differentiating the self from the five sheets, through the method of distinguishing between the variable and the invariable, that means what's changing and what's changeless, one can draw out one's own self from the five sheets and attain the supreme Brahman. Attain in quotes, because you already are Brahman, so you can't attain yourself. The purpose is to draw out... Okay, so that was the verse. Okay, just the, it's, you're going to use an example. Uh, just forget about everything that we said so far. Example to demonstrate this uh, discrimination. Suppose you have brown sugar. Brown sugar looks very coarse, very rough, and brownish. Now suppose you mix the brown. Sh I'm giving you an example, Lloyd. You have to look at. That. Now suppose you mix the. <laughs> suppose you put the sugar and you put the stones together. Now the stones look brownish, they look, you know, the same like sugar. So now how do you discriminate between what is sugar? I don't need the stones, you know, I need to put, I need to put, I don't want stones in my tea, I want sugar in my tea. So how do you now take away the sugar from the tea, from the stones? Very efficiently and very quickly. Water. One dissolves, one dissolves, that's the part of the so, well, you can, for example, well, one ineffective way is to like, you know, analyze, <laughs> taste one each, <laughs> but that's way too slow, right? So, in other words, we need something that's efficient and fast, a technique, a method. So, pancha kosha viveka is in the same way, like melting the sugar, putting all of that into a little a furnace, and letting all the dr sugar drip out, and instantly you got the sugar and you leave the stones where they are, and you throw the what? Vyatireka, the non-essential variables away, and you only keep the what is essential. You only keep that which is ever-present, invariable. Okay. Now, application of this method. Oh, now we can read. Example of the king and the chief ministers. In a country, there were four states. A person wanted to know who the king of the country was. He, became to, he, he came to know that the king was touring in all of the four states in the country with the company of the chief minister of each state. That means the one who takes care of the state. Now this person followed their movements. That means followed the king and the chief ministers. In each state... There were at least two people together, always on the tour. That means always the king and the chief minister, and sometimes even three. Maybe a friend comes over. Now, by observing carefully, this man or woman noticed that one of them was present in all of the states. While the accompanying person or the persons differed in each state. That means the chief ministers were changing, but someone was always present. So he concluded that the common person in the group had to be the king and that the others were the chief minister and his people who like to be around. In the present case, the four states were called, instead of New South Wales and Queensland, they were called the waking state, the dream state, the deep sleep state, and the fourth, quote, state, the Turiya, or the state of wholeness, the state of completion. Each of these four states was scanned, was analyzed by who? By the person who was seeing awesome. who is always present and who is changing. Who is variable and who is invariable. As a result of this scanning, this person wanted to see which of the six principles are present and which are absent. The number six is going to be important. Why? For example, we've got how many koshas? Five. Five. Plus self, six. six. So, for example, we take the, uh, the self. 
So the first word, the bhane, just means present, and abhane means absent. So when you look at the waking state, and we go, okay, in the waking state right now, in my body, is there a body? Do you have a body? Yes. Present. Pranamaya kosha, mano, vijnanamaya, are you thinking? Is there digestion? All of that? Present. Ananda, is there happiness being with someone you like? Yes, present. So therefore, waking state, all of them are present, including the self, the Atman, the awareness because of which I get to um, you know, see the others. I get to be aware of the others. Now, in the dream state, when we're dreaming, Abhane means not present. Is your body present in the dream state? Yes. No. Can you say that in the dream? No. So you can only say it in the waking state. Yeah, in but we're not in the waking state, we're now in the dream state. Okay. So I want you to imagine yourself in the dream state. Dream state. Yeah. So in the dream state, there's no such thing as body. Someone can come and with a pillow, you know, bang you a couple of times for having a conversation that they didn't win last night. And you won't even feel a thing. You'll just have a big bruise next morning. <laughs> so the prana, maya, manoma, and vijnana, maya, all of them are somewhat present in the dream state. Why? Because what do we dream? About our life. So there is uh, an aspect of memory. There is an aspect of a little bit of thinking. Um, however, it's not conscious thinking. And there One is... question can I ask? Like, if you're, doing, if you're dreaming, uh, I understand the body is not there, but only the body is dreaming, isn't it? Unless the body, the subtle body, the gross body is there, how will you dream? That gross body is there. Yeah, but you only say that from the waking state. Can you say that from the dream state? No, not in the dream so, state. But the body is there as no, physical. It's, it's, you're now going back into the waking state. We can't, you can only say that from the state has nothing to do with the dream. When we're in the dream, there is no conversation where, where is my body? So one thing to keep in mind is that I'm, I'm trying to switch you and isolate just the waking state as one state of experience, okay. totally separate from the dream state dream because state. they have no connection at yeah, all. Right. For example, okay, suppose that you have a, a glass of water at your bedside table, physical, in this, in this, dream, in this waking state, yeah. okay? And is that glass of water going to appease your thirst in the dream? No. That's what I mean. It doesn't matter that there is a body. It doesn't matter that there is a glass of water or food. In the dream state, what works to appease your thirst? Dream water. So in other words, they have nothing to do with each other. Now, in the deep sleep state, that means where there is nothing. What is in deep sleep? I'm just wondering. Darkness. Darkness, what else? Ignorance. Now watch how there's there is, there is knowledge of nothing. Now watch. Okay, I'm gonna say it. What is in ignorance? Can someone tell me? Notice how there's silence. We need to like think about it. But what if I say, um, "Hey, so where's your house?" You see how you have a different reaction? Because everything in this waking state, you are aware. You know. You know this knowledge. But in the deep sleep, they're like, "Whoa, I don't know." I don't know exactly. I don't know. There's nothing. There's nothing to say. So, in the deep sleep state, is there a physical body? If you said yes, where would be the flaw in that thinking? Suppose you say there is a body in deep sleep. Huh? You're not aware of the body, but the body is there. Only awareness is waking state. No. no, there needs to be a correction, <coughs> correction in thinking. You're only saying that from what state? Waking in the state. waking state. In the waking state. In the deep. Can you say that in the deep sleep no. state? No. No. There's no body. Okay. So there's nothing. Therefore, there's nothing to say. You just saying there's nothing. So there's no mental activity. There's no thinking. There's nothing. Therefore, absent, absent, absent. Even jo even joys are. Uh, uh, okay. How about joy? Is that present in a deep sleep? No. No, no when you wake up. You, uh, you, you no, no it, says, it says present. It says yeah, present in, in deep sleep. Why is joy present in deep sleep? Well, there's no there's sorrow, no, there's so no there suffering. has to be joy. Lack of suffering. That's what we say. You know, I, I slept, I, I, slept, I, I, I want to go to sleep. If, if sleep was painful, would you go to sleep? No. So in other words, sleep is what? Just pure so, ignorance, but it's blissful. That's why we're so happy, generally happy. In because you get up very uh, yeah, refreshed. Yeah, I slept so well. I slept so, so deeply. 
In other words, there is still causal body in deep sleep. And what is causal body? Avidya. What is avidya? Total tamaguna. That means tamaguna, nothing to know, total ignorance, and yet there is um, anandamaya kosha, the, uh, the happiness of the joy of self. Because nothing is obstructing the self. The mind is not obstructing the self. The, our life is not obstructing the self. Nothing is obstructing the self. That's why we're happy. Okay, now this chart you can find on the site, so I'm not going to go too much detail, but you get the idea. So you're, you're being like one of those people, and I'm looking, what is present here now? Da, 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 da. I am still present in where? In the waking state? Are you present now? Yes. Are you present in the dream? Yes, that's why one says, I dream. Oh, I don't dream. I wish I dreamed. You know, I can't remember my dreams. The point is, you still relate to the word dream. Therefore, you do Existing. pervade the dream. And deep sleep, we constantly talk about sleeping in and out. Whether you analyze it or not, that means we know about deep sleep. Otherwise, you'll be saying, so what's deep sleep? Did you notice that there's always a word for something that exists? There's never a word for something that doesn't exist. Ghost. Huh? Uh, it's not even just a word because it's language it, 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 it's for the intellect so that's why we can't, we don't relate very well to saying there is joy in deep sleep because I mean, even joy is a an intellectual idea there and we're just saying okay but we're still saying that from the waking state um, I want you to analyze the deep sleep that's place of nothingness. But you can't analyze deep sleep while you're deep sleeping, can you? No. You can only analyze from the waking state. The waking yeah. state only. Only yeah. from the waking state. So from that aspect of analyzing that deep, like why, why am I so, why? Remember as children, like we got some issues, and then we want to go, we want to go sleep. I just, I don't want to be here anymore. I just want to go sleep. Why? Because we knew that that sleep is that place of joy, place of nothingness, place of the place of freedom. No pain. Nothing. There's not. There's not even observer nor the observed. It's just nothing. And that nothingness is expressed as experiential joy. It is still not the self. It is still mitya. <coughs> That's the important point. Mm -hmm. It is close. It's a good indicator of the self, of infinite, but it's not the infinite. It is still maya generated infinite. Okay. Now, what's the logic of this this discrimination? The basic logic of such method is, the important part, if I can be without something, stop there, can you be without your clothes? Yes. You can. <laughs> Depends where you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you be without your arm? Don't yeah, some people are yes. yeah. the hands. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If it exists, so we can be without the body parts, certainly, until the heart stops, but we'll just keep the heart still beating. So we can be without ears, nose, tongue, you know, that's easy to, to, to understand. You even have today people on YouTube, you know, no arms and no legs, and they actually go through, the, through you know, inspiring other people how they still have a life, even though they don't have arms and legs. But that's not normal. That's not normal, but they're still... They're still they do the, exist for certain reasons like the, the point is they still know who they are it's not like mm -hmm. i i am minus my legs <laughs> you know i am minus my arms they're still a person yeah that is so if i can be without something th that something cannot be me logical mm -hmm. Very logical. if i am without my shirt then i cannot be the shirt and thus i am not that which i can be without in a dream, I am without the gross body, meaning I don't need the physical body to exist. To, yes, to identify or exist. Yeah. That's the whole point. We think we need the body to exist. Therefore, we have fear of dying. But if you spend time inquiring into this process, then you'll discover that your body is completely unnecessary to continue existing. This is what we all want. I just want to continue existing. Therefore, I don't want to die. But what is this saying? You actually don't need that instrument which will die. You don't need it to continue existing. Therefore, what happens? I am free of the fear of death. You see how liberating that becomes? Mm -hmm. I like that image that if you hold your arm up, you say, is that me? And you say, yes. 
It's me. Uh, if I cut my arm off and put it over there, uh, you say, is that me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you see, excellent. Yeah, yeah, just like your hair, you know, it's still a part of it, but when it goes out, you don't, excellent. you know, you don't connect it to yourself. Good. Now, what's next? Scanning the dream state. We have scanned the waking state, now let's scan the dream state. Verse. The physical body present in one's consciousness right now is absent in the dream state. But the witnessing element, that means the pure consciousness, persists both in the waking and the dream state. That means I am still here and I am still (laughs) here. This is the invariable presence, that means the non-changing presence, anvaya, of the self, that means consciousness. Though the self is perceived, the physical body is not. So therefore, the physical body becomes invariable. It becomes variable, becomes non-essential, becomes not required for me to be, not required for me to exist. Commentaries. In the dream, the gross body is totally absent. In the dream, so you can't now say, no, it's no, no, it's there. You're saying that from the waking, but in the dream. But the subtle body that is the wit- that is witnessing the dream is naturally present. Okay? So what is the subtle body? Remember? Feelings and intellect. That's why your life is in the dream. It's not like someone else's life, your life is. So we have now what? This this discovered that we don't need the physical body to exist. But we need this, the mind and the intellect to exist. Don't go forward, just follow the logic. I still need my intellect and my mind to exist, okay? Because we will discard it later on. Conclusion, the subtle body continues in the dream, therefore it is essential. At this point, it is still essential. Therefore, it's anvaya. As far as the waking and dream states are concerned, it is essential, but the gross body is eliminated. Okay, so the gross body we have now discovered, we don't need. Thus the gross body becomes, from the aspect of the dream, non-essential. But this fact alone, but the fact alone that the gross body is, this shows that the gross body is indeed unreal. That means it's not necessary for existence. The subtle body qualifies for the next stage of the scanning process. So far, we all need our minds to exist. Okay, without your mind, you're gone. Sorry. Now, what's huh? I'm oh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, in reincarnation, it's the causal body. Yeah, and the karana sharia. As well as the subtle. Yeah. No, the, no, the, the karana sharia gives birth to the subtle body according to the samskaras. Okay, so that you only need the karana shari, you don't need the subtle body. Because the subtle body is just a way to express the invisible habits, the invisible likes and dislikes. To express, to express. this last causal body. I need to think right. that I'm addicted to something. For that to think, I need a mind. Therefore, I need a subtle okay, body. So you need the subtle body to um, play at the causal body in the next life. Indeed, yeah. So the ca- causal body gives birth to the subtle body and subtle body gives birth to the gross body because I can't just think I want something. I want to actually connect with it physically. So therefore, all these three bodies are needed. Now, what destroys the causal body? Pancha, Kosha, Viveka. What we're doing now, by constantly negating, rejecting, that destroys ignorance. That means you're not born next life. In fact, you can't say you are not born because you were never born. But you, you don't get another body. Now, the subtle body is also discovered to be vyatireka, non-essential, in the next verse, in reference to deep sleep. Okay, now, verse 39. We'll take a break in uh, five minutes. In deep sleep... While the subtle body is absent, that's why we say there's nothing there, the eye sense is present, making it continuous. The former subtle body drops off. Therefore, the subtle body is no longer required for our existence. 
For though present in the dream, that means the subtle body is present in the dream, there is no sign of it in deep sleep. Again, that's why we continuously say there's nothing, there's total darkness, total ignorance in the, in the deep sleep. Okay. Just as we do not include our clothing in the meaning of the word I, got that? See, we know instantly, like I'm not the uh, clothing, but we think that about our bodies. The three bodies should not be included in the meaning of the word I, instruction. What comes and goes is incidental. So we are now discerned. The gross body comes and goes according to the dream state. The subtle body comes and goes in reference to the deep sleep state. Now, I know what you're going to say. What about the causal body? How do we, can we prove that that also comes and goes? That's going to be a next inquiry. Because if we cannot negate the causal body, see, remember deep sleep, what stays? Anandamaya kosha. If we cannot negate the anandamaya kosha, we have a problem. Because then we have to, you know, think, well, wait a minute, I am ignorance. So now we have to negate the Anandamaya Kosha also, but not yet. <clears throat> now the deep sleep state is not the existence, it is, not, is not the non-existence of the I awareness. Okay, so deep sleep state, when we sleep, does not mean the non-existence of I. Why not? You're talking about deep sleep right now. That means you're still pervading deep sleep. Nobody, so in other words, if sleep is the non existence of you, the self, then what's going to happen? Everyone would be afraid to go to deep sleep because who wants to go out of existence? Does anyone want to go out of existence? Not a single person wants to go out of existence. Therefore, if I knew that deep sleep, is going out of existence, then I would never go to deep sleep. But do we all go to deep sleep gladly? Mm, you don't know. Gladly. Mm. Huh? We have no problem going to sleep. I just want to sleep. And of all of this, I'm tired, this is this, I just want to sleep. In other words, what does this mean? Sure. You already know that I that I am not going to go out of existence in deep sleep. How do you know that? Because you're pervading a deep sleep. How do you know that deep sleep is not going to hurt you? Otherwise, you wouldn't go to sleep. That means what? You already know that deep sleep is completely safe. How do you know it's safe? Because you pervade it. Otherwise, you wouldn't go to sleep. You're always the elephant. Yeah. So we have now established that we know that deep sleep is not harmful. <laughs> We know that it's joyful, that's why we all want to go to sleep. And even though we all say there's nothing there, the fact that we want to gladly sleep means what? That I already know the condition that deep sleep is just safe. It is generally blissful, it is generally happy. Because we always do things, why? To enjoy. We never do things to get hurt. You understand? Who wants to do things to get hurt? Nobody. But we all go to sleep gladly, thus we know that it is um, a place of warmth, a place of um, safety. What's next? We're going to negate the causal body also. And then I want to come hopefully to Tatvamasi, a very important Mahavakya, because there's a huge significance of understanding what Tatvamasi means. Okay, break five minutes. So verse 4 is just going to remind us that indeed the subtle bodies, um, prana, mind and intellect is negatable. Uh, we have sort of done a general inquiry why it's negatable according to the three states and why we don't need it to exist. So all we're doing here, just to give some context, all you're trying to do is discover what is always present, what is a non, what is a essential, invariable principle that has to exist 
prior to everything else that has that is always present in my experience in other words you go throughout the day suppose there's a um, <clears throat> like some situation at work and attention comes what's what's present I am like self is present you come back home there's a lot of joy maybe you see someone that you like <clears throat> what's still present I am now what's what's no longer present the situation at work so that was not real but I'm still present now the joy as a result of seeing someone is going to end also because you know you go some you go to the bathroom for example now they are no longer present also but what's still present I am so this is the example of what it means to say um, constant discrimination what is here constantly uh, never never not available Okay, what is always present? I Yeah. So, so go back to the initial question, like some tight situation in family about someone. That someone is going to trigger our emotions, no doubt. I'm not saying they're not, because I know how tight, how deep these ingrained... Um, uh, so we have to be realistic. But it doesn't matter. Even though that is still occurring, still get into the habit of negating, of rejecting emotions, feelings, thoughts as not I, as, as constantly variable when the emotion is not so strong. I say that because when the emotion hits, when it's present about someone close to us, it's already too late, realistically speaking. It's too late. Then we don't feel like doing discrimination. Do you notice that? So this means you need to start on small things. This is why uh, use the uh, situation every day to play out this discrimination according to what I see, how I feel, like even blowing your nose. Excellent opportunity. What is present? The sound. What is present? The feeling. What is present? The, the, you know, the experience. After it's gone, what's still present? I am. What's no longer present? the experience of blowing the nose, the experience of doing whatever it is. So then when the emotion is strong, as it will be, I know the feeling, then it becomes much easier to simply understand this as something that is coming and going. Okay, so start small on easy things. I'm not saying I'll go and do this, you know, on those who are really there, you know, always grab you every time. It's too hard. So be realistic, start small. Okay, first, by further discriminating the I, the I, no, by further discrimination, the I is seen to be distinct from all the sheets. Indeed, being in the realm of the three gunas and three states, they differ from the one principle because of which they are aware and from each other. So what do we just say here? We said that not only does the prana change, one moment I feel hungry, one moment I don't feel hungry, that's what? Changing prana. Anything that's changing, anything that's variable, means it is unreal. One moment I feel uh, extremely happy, next moment, normal. What's changed? Mind. Emotion. In other words, it is also unreal. One moment you have an epiphany, one moment the epiphany is gone. That means that epiphany is also unreal. One moment I have an epiphany that I now know who I am, but the moment, but the mo, but the fact is, the fact that that epiphany started means it is unreal. You can't have an epiphany of who you are. Impossible, because that <clears throat> means it is bound to time. You're always present. You never were not present. So anything that begins, that's why you can't say I am now enlightened. Impossible, because that means what? That suddenly consciousness is coming before it wasn't there. <laughs> okay. Now, furthermore, the prana is made up of rajaguna. The mind and the intellect is made up of mixture of raja and sattva. Tamaguna is the gross body, Anamaya Kosha. 
So what do we now said about discriminating as not I? Anything that is variable, okay? We gave you several examples. Now, what, what are you actually discriminating? The cautious the thoughts. But what are these thoughts made out of? The gunas. So what are you also discriminating? The gunas. the gunas which make up the entire creation, including the walls, including the people, including the weather, including the airplane, including the sounds, all the five elements, the entire universe of things is also being discriminated along with the three, um, with the mind when you discriminate the subtle body. Because the thought is only made up of three gunas, and to discriminate the thought is not I, you're also discriminating the entire Maya as not I. Because Maya is made up of three gunas. Now, how the three sheets are anatma? That means the pranamaya, the mind, and the intellect. How is it not self? How is it unreal? Sheet number one, pranamaya kosha. Since this is the life sheath, the vital air, the vital fo life force, one may argue that it has to be continuous as its discontinuity would mean death. Yeah. Fair? Fair argument? Yes. Okay. True. The pranas are working in all the three states, even in deep sleep and the dream, no doubt. We know that um, because you wouldn't be you know, talking now. But the point in question is, are we aware of their presence in dream and deep sleep as we are in the waking state? No. no. So instantly that qualifies prana as not permanent, unreal. For something to be real, it has to always exist at all times and it's never not available. <clears throat> so we are not aware of the prana in deep sleep and in the dream we are only partially aware of it due to the little mental activity. But the point is that all the five sheets are subject to variances and anything that varies is unreal, which you can discard as not I. Now, the mind, the Mano Maya Kosha. The mind's availability or activity also is variable in the three states, no doubt. It is not available at all in deep sleep. So, Pranamaya changes, Mano Maya changes according to the three states, and also in each state there's a, uh, there's a different quality to it. Now, next, intellect sheet. The intellect is not available at all in your dream. Why not? Can you think inside a dream? Unless you tra you're training yourself, but can you do you generally think like, hmm, this is a dream, interesting. Five <laughs> elements. You go like that? No. 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 So what is a dream? Just a dump of all of your vasanas constantly. It's like a stream of just unconscious stuff falling inside and creating your dream. So what is your dream? Nothing <clears throat> but a spontaneous dump of vasanas in the subtle body. So therefore there's very little thinking. I know you can say now, you know, but I can still uh, think about my dream like lucid dreaming or astral projection. Um, you can train yourself because there's always exceptions in Maya. However, a dream is generally does not require intellect. You don't need intellect for, to dream. You don't need to think in order to continue or to sustain your dream. It's just going on at its own accord. We thus find that all three <coughs> subtle body sheets are, are to be non-essential for the eye to exist. Clear? We don't need the gross body because we still exist in a deep sleep. Otherwise, we wouldn't go to deep sleep. If I was afraid that my gross, that, that I needed my gross body, <clears throat> they're all absent at some stage, hence unreal. In this way, we can now conclude that all three sheets differ uh, and thus are unreal. Okay, so this means your prana is unreal, mind is unreal, intellect is unreal. What's next? Having separated the Atma from the gross body and the subtle body, now we need to discard and negate the causal body. 
and we see how even the causal body can indeed be negated while we are alive. Okay, verse 41. Causal body, no, verse, we're just going to read the verse. <clears throat> In the state of Nirvakalpa Samadhi, the microcosmic causal body does not exist. Becomes, in other words, non-essential for the I to exist. So it is an inconsistent factor. In Nirvakalpa Samadhi, the self exists at the as the witnessing awareness and therefore it is invariable. Okay, now, <clears throat> Nirvakalpa Samadhi is something that only a yogi can perform through years of practice. So we just have to take their word of what they're saying. For most of us who will never attain Nirvakalpa Samadhi because it requires a lot of alone time, a lot of uh, pranayama, a lot of, you know, tons of yogic practices for years and years to attain a state of Nirvakalpa Samadhi. So we'll just read what it is. The scanning process moves into a fourth state. Now I know Turiya said last time is the quote fourth state. Now put the fourth state, scratch it out, and the fourth state will be now Nirvakalpa Samadhi. State one, dream. State two, no, state one, waking. State two, dream. State three, deep sleep. State four, Nirvakalpa Samadhi. So all these three states we go through as normal people. If you're a yogi, you will also be the, you also get to appreciate and enjoy the state four, which is Nirvakalpa Samadhi. This is a state of temporary enlightenment or illumination. Nirvikalpa. We are thus compelled to take into account the reports of the yogis who have reached it <clears throat> and place our trust in their feelings. On their findings, yeah. Nirvikalpa, thank you. Nirvikalpa Samadhi is a state of pure objectless isless isness. Now, I added those two last words because if you put isness, that's error already. You cannot say in Nirvakalpa Samadhi there's isness. Because even isness, there's a subtle implication of a dualistic phenomena to say something exists. Because to say something exists, there has to be a principle of a witness who is disting distinguishing him or herself from the witnessed. So that's why I'm canceling out isness with the preceding word with isless isness. So this will be the description of one who is in, in Nirvakalpa Samadhi. It is a state in which the causal body, that means the Anandamaya Kosha, is absent. It is not a waking state. There are no thoughts to produce experiences. And there is no external world to experience. Because all the senses are absorbed in the self as the self. And it's also not deep sleep, because in sleep there is self-ignorance, while in Nirvakalpa Samadhi there is only isless isness, or there's no word to describe it. There's just existence. There's just self, total, limitless, infinite self. That's why those who come out of Nirvakalpa Samadhi, uh, sometimes you can go for hours in it, then they will usually go into a state of depression because the, um, the infinity of Nirvakalpa Samadhi is so great that when there's a coming back to it in this world, then it's like it's so heavy in comparison. It's like, oh my God, you know, I was in a place of total yes. knowledge. Not even I was because that's also another era. But there, was, there, there is a place of total knowledge and total infinity. And now it feels so heavy and limiting and so on. Are you saying that this state is only reached by these yogis or is it accidentally achieved sometimes by others? Not accidentally. It's only deliberately done through years of practice. Because the heart has to be slowed down. You have to control your prana. You have to slow down everything. You have to slow down your thoughts. Total control of the mind, of the so prana. Would such a person get depressed when they come back? Yeah, because then, then they just... Be trained? Just to see that, oh, it's just the mind. Well, yeah, but I don't think it's too serious. The depression just means in comparison to, right, there's this, like a surprise. There's a surprise. They're still detached, of course, because to reach Nirvakalpa, you have to be detached in the first place. Mm. 
So it's not like they're going to be now, you know, going to a mental institution. But um, I'm just saying, in comparison, it's very heady. So this is how the experience of being on, on Earth is. If you were to compare it, it's like there was nothing. I was pure consciousness, and now I come back on Earth. But because it's babies, we cannot express that. We soon forget the, the our limitless nature, and then this Earth becomes very normal. So we sort of give credit to this heavy Earth. It is something beyond the mind. You, you can't use the mind to reach that state <clears throat> because the mind is a, a tool. The mind, um, the mind is going to be used in stage of dharana, that is concentration, and that will through time lead to dhyanam, where there is a spontaneous absorption, and then dhyanam, which is discussed in chapter six, will lead to samadhi, and samadhi will lead to uh, sabhikalpa samadhi. That means there is a I witness and there is a witnessed. That means I am now witnessing absence of objects that's called sabhikalpa samadhi it is still extremely uh, it's like infinity i am witnessing nothing so i am there witnessing absence of objects it's a lot better than deep sleep because deep sleep is nobody witnessing anything but in sabhikalpa samadhi there is an i who is aware who is witnessing non-duality which is still not which is still not true non-duality because it's still an i and there's still nothing but true non-dual experience is nirvikalpa, when the I, that witness, and the existence of nothingness merge. That means there's nobody to make a claim that they're observing nothingness. There just is... We're not even saying anything, right? Okay. So that's the kind of people we're speaking of. And this is not new. Um, this is not actually, it shouldn't be surprising. In the yoga world, this is actually quite achievable and attainable. Especially in the yoga world, uh, people will. Have you ever seen someone in the Kalpa Samadhi? Yeah, they will. Uh, you can stay for several days and lose your uh, total connection with the world. Mm -hmm. And you feel like maybe an hour. It's like, how long have I been out? Several days, what? Yeah, there are yogis in India who never eat for nearly 30, 40 years. They You're probably. Still surviving. Yeah, yeah, and you'll never see them. You'll never see them because you, you're away from the environment, there's no disturbances, very alone. And um, it requires a lot of discipline. Yeah. This is actually what people try to attain through the psychedelics sometimes. You know, they'll take mm -hmm. ayahuasca and then they will, but usually they'll fail because nirvikalpa requires a very disciplined, sattvic mind. Yeah. Now, the observation. So, in other words, it, it is a state that is free of the vasanas that produce karma and action. So, why do we just mention? causal body. So in this state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, there is no ignorance. And what is causal body? Ignorance. But there is no ignorance. There is only total knowledge. Not even, you can't even say the word knowledge. There's just existence, isness, fullness, limitlessness, Satchivananda. And there is no causal body. Meaning what? We don't need the causal body to exist. We don't need vasanas. We don't need the samskaras to exist that's why it was mentioned the conclusion is thus as follows avidya being present and absent that means being present in all the three states and being absent in nirvakalpa samadhi also now as a result becomes non-essential it drops out or separates whereas the self whose presence is continuous in all four states is proved to be essential or continuous. It is thus shown that our true I is the self. So what do we just establish? So many changes in all three states, except Nirvikalpa Samadhi, even deep sleep, there's nothing much to say. But even the states themselves, just to say dream, just to say deep sleep, just to say um, waking, just to say Nirvikalpa, all are names and forms. Pervaded by what? One same I. Right. So the I we have now discerned, you, awareness, is essential. Now what's next? Now the teacher is going to cite Katha Upanishad to support this technique. Okay, discrimination needs to be a delicate and precise, needs a um, precise intellect. Verse 42. As the pith, what is the pith? Pith is a cylindrical, soft, spongy surface, uh, like little uh, of, of a plant in the center. 
So imagine a flat circle, right in the center is a pith. The pith of the munja grass, I believe munja is an Indian grass, yeah. 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 can be drawn out, that is detached from, its gross external covering. That's why we said the pith is the, the center. Just imagine grass and you pull out like something that's in, in, inside it. The self can be distinguished through reasoning from the three bodies of the five sheets. It is then recognized as unconditioned awareness. That is, I am essentially of the nature of Brahman. So, what's the metaphor for this verse? What it's saying is, in order to extract out of this grass, munja grass, the pith, which is extremely tiny, very, very small, it needs what kind of a mind? Very patient, delicate, soft, trained, eye, sharp mind, extremely sharp. You give it to someone who's generally careless, uh, generally, you know, rough, they're not going to succeed. So what it's saying is in order to discriminate the five sheets, we need a very delicate, sharp intellect. And how do we develop that? Through sadhana. And we speak to that in the Gita ongoingly. Mm -hmm. So this is not a process for those who are still looking for different kind of things in the world. It needs a very sharp intellect. Okay, to say... Uh, next one. To say I am ever free awareness, but my wife is not free, is undiscriminating. <laughs> because consciousness does not have a wife. Only Jiva has a wife. <laughs> you cannot say that you are enlightened and your wife is not enlightened. Because enlightenment means your awareness. And since there is only awareness, your wife is also awareness. Therefore, your wife is also enlightened, if you are truly liberated. The only way to make your wife unenlightened is to define enlightenment as some kind of a unique experience or special knowledge. Very important point. You can see this comes from a married man, James, up there. So he's obviously you know, probably thinking of his wife while he's writing this. So this is a very valid point because we often go around, we, you know, we don't we just think of it in a sense of uh, enlightenment being some special status. And because I have that special status and my wife doesn't, she's ignorant and I am knowledgeable. This is wrong thinking. If one, if one is truly liberated, what does liberation mean? I have done panchakosha enough to constantly negate the five sheets in, in, in where such a thought would arise. So such a thought like my wife is unenlightened, where is that thought? Vijnana Maya Kosha. If I've truly done my work and I've negated that also, then a, such a thought of, of her being or him being unenlightened is not going to arise at all. So in other words, to truly be liberated, one is genuinely associated or identified with consciousness. When I say one, I mean intellect is genuinely focused constantly 24-7, 365 on consciousness and thus it's sees everything else as consciousness. So this is an important point because as soon as judgment comes, like I have Vedantic knowledge and I am now knowledgeable while the world is ignorant, you can say that, but only if you are what? Objectively stating it on the basis of the minds, the intellects is what doesn't know who they are. But just to generalize and say the world is ignorant, that's a very dangerous uh, thing to do right there. Okay, so that's a very uh, interesting barometer to, uh, to call others unenlightened. That, that just reveals where we're at in this journey. That means we've got more discernment to do. We've got more negation to do, more rejection to do. Now, the, deep, the deeper the study of the scriptures and reflection on the truth, the, the weaker the attachment to the five koshas. That's a general reminder. The more study of the scriptures, the longer, the less these five koshas have a hold on our life. That means less agitations, less judgment, less concern, less attachment to those who usually trigger our emotions. 
the priorities thus become clear as a result of this reflection and discernment on the five courses. Okay, so this is describing a direct, uh, quote, experience of one who is doing this generally. What's direct reflection? How, does, how do you measure if you're getting close? What's one measure of um, discerning if this is actually working? How do you tell if this is working, this Panchakosha Viveka? Maybe you'd be less reactive. Less excellent, less reactive. Calmness of the mind. Calmness of the mind more often. And even the, the emotional uh, trigger is not so strong as it was uh, before Vedanta was there. I'm saying this because you need to assess where you are. Otherwise, there's no measure. We cannot say if we're moving forward. Otherwise, it becomes a waste of time. So non judgmental? Huh? Non judgmental. <coughs> non judgmental, yeah. It means objectivity. <coughs> okay, what I mean by objectivity? Suppose there's a person in your family, and uh, usually we get annoyed or we get kind of you know triggered by them. So, what does it mean to be objective towards them? It simply means this you know, this person to who I am responding to. They also have a mind, they also have an intellect, they also have a memory, and they also have karma, they also have samskaras. On the basis of, of their samskaras, their vasanas, it's causing them to have a certain view about the world, including me. So it's not really personal. They can't help it. For example, if I look at you in a particular way, I can't help it because I'm looking at it through what? Through my education, through my work that I've done on myself. If someone looks at me in a way that hurts me, can they help it? Okay, so this is what objectivity means. You're being objective. What is going on in their process? You're not taking that person. You're simply looking, okay, so their memory is reacting. <clears throat> their memory has a certain view about me. Their conclusion about me is, you know, it's, it's done. And it's not going to change. And this person, which is pervaded by consciousness, who I am, that consciousness is pervading this mind also, just like it's pervading this mind. So all that's really happening is two minds are having a conversation. They're having a different program, a different view about life. But, but everything's fine. I still continue. I still continue as awareness. And that same awareness is what? Pervading that same mind, which I don't agree with. So what are we doing? We're changing focus from the specifics to the one pervading principle, awareness. What pervades Martin's mind? Awareness. What pervades Andre's mind? Awareness. That awareness, I am. Martin, I am not. Andre, I am not. So therefore now it becomes less personal. What have we covered so far? Okay, so the logic of Anvaya and Vyatireka that is essential and non-essential is that by stripping the jiva of its five encasing sheets, <coughs> the self, though, because when we get to the Tatwamasi now, the, the that though, the self, the though, that means... <laughs> Thou. Sorry. Is it thou? Yeah, thou. <laughs> okay, thou. So the self, the uh, twum, I like Sanskrit more. So the self, the, the twum, which is non different from Brahman, himself is left. So this means when we strip all of those five sheets, what's left is awareness. What's right. left is the self, Atman. The text moves now further. We're now done with the discrimination to show that the universe, the entire universe has a self. That associated with a vast upadi, a vast conditioning of the three gunas. And the same stripping process results in identity of the universal self as Brahman. Hence, that equals thou. So, what this is saying is, the entire universe is made up of three guna. The person is also made up of three guna. If I strip this person of the, the, the five sheets, which is made up of three guna, what's left? 
Amazing. awareness. We have done this in the previous verses. That same constituents that make up this body make up what? The entire creation. Mm -hmm. Because this body is part of creation. So therefore, what makes up this body is unreal. And therefore, whatever makes up the universe, since it's the same material, thus the universe is also unreal. So what, what does this mean? What's left? Awareness. Yeah. So therefore, now we jump into Mahavakya, Tatvamasi, and we need to analyze Tatvam and Asi, all three words, to see the significance of this amazing uh, Mahavakya. Verse 43. In the same way, the oneness of the Jivatma and Paramatma, the means Brahman, is logically established by Tatvamasi, by a technique of rejecting irrelevant parts and retaining the irrelevant parts. <laughs> I know, but I'm just changing. The relevant and irrelevant. The because you're going to have to, you know, what's irrelevant? The punch of kosher. What's relevant? The substratum, the necklace. Now, the bhaga tyaga is the technique that's called for this discrimination. And it means to discriminate between primary meaning of a word and the implied meaning. I'll explain this. Okay. So, Bhagatyaga, explanation. You hear the statement, I ate an apple. I just ate an apple. Did I mean by that statement that I also ate the seeds? No. How do you know that? It's implied. It's implied. In other words, I said I ate an apple, but you knew that actually meant I only ate the outside, I didn't eat the seeds. Or, in this example, I exist. You know, sometimes we say in a class, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, I exist, that's all there is to this. Okay, let's analyze the statement. When we say I exist, from the aspect of no Vedanta, what are we including in that statement? Because the body? The, all the three bodies. Mm. But now we say I exist, same statement, what are, we, what are we excluding automatically without having to mention it? The three bodies. So that means I exist as what? Consciousness. Awareness, consciousness. So in other words, the point is from now on we need to be very careful when we say the word I. Because we use the word I, whatever language it is, whatever language we speak, we use it all day long. So this word I now has an implied meaning. It's meaning what? I as awareness. So when I say, you know, I went today to the shopping mall. What are you saying? I awareness am aware or was aware of the body, call whatever your name is, going to the shopping mall. Before I went to the shopping mall meant what? The three, bo the two bodies, the causal body doesn't go anywhere. The two bodies, well, actually the subtle body doesn't go anywhere. Else. The physical body went to the shopping mall. So this means we have to be very careful when we use the word I. So how do you do this when it's so unconsciously said? By starting small, as I said before. Start small with this process of discrimination. Until the, the I becomes very clear that it's only referring to the essential principle, which is the self. Now commentaries. The five sheets which make it seem as if awareness is limited, the self is limited, are actually non-essential because they can be negated. Identification with a sheath is bondage. So therefore, what is samsara? What, what continues samsara? Identification with one or more of these five sheets. Why are we here again in this life, born? Because we have, in a previous life, attended to, gave reality to one of the five sheets. Now, verse 44, tat. What does the word tat mean? Of tat tuamasi? That. Yeah, okay, but there's more to it. See, this is a, a good example where, to, just to say a word, you have to first know, be educated before we say it. So it's got so much more meaning. Okay, verse. 
Brahman in association with the Tama Guna, Maya. So, Brahman, pure consciousness in association with Tama Guna becomes the material cause of the universe. We discussed this all the way in verse 17 or 18, I believe, at the beginning of this. You'll see it on the site. Now, the material cause is made up of the five subtle elements, tanmatras. If you have revised, we will know these names by now. <clears throat> okay, so again, summary. Brahman in association with tamaguna equals material cause. This bottle equals what? Brahman associated with tamaguna. See, we have to be like, this is, we're talking about now, not some other time at historical place. And this Brahman becomes the efficient cause, that is the intelligent cause, in association with the Sattva Guna. And this is what is meant by the word Tat, that. So here's what we just said. When we say the word that, what are we saying? We're saying both, we're, we're, we're going through both the material and the intelligence all the way to Brahman. But we're not ignoring the fact that there is a Tamaguna, there is a material cause, and there is a efficient cause. So when I say that, I am acknowledging the material, I am acknowledging the intelligence, but despite acknowledging their presence, I'm actually referring to what? Original, unchanged consciousness, Brahman. So saying just that, you, you cannot ignore this reality because this reality is what makes you say that. You see, you need words. Words are what? Gunas. So I cannot reject the gunas by just going that. I'm talking about Brahman. Even B-R-A, B-R-H, so on, there's all sounds. Sound is a property of what? Space. Space is what? Material cause. Material cause is what? Upadana Karanam, the material cause, which is Brahman in association with Tama Guna. Now, if we haven't understood, here's a chance to understand. What is the material cause of creation? Consciousness, that means pure original consciousness, Satchit Ananda, in other words, Brahman, in association with Avidya. What is Avidya? If you remember when we started, we said Avidya is when uh, Shuddha and Ashuddha Prakriti, Ashuddha Prakriti was Tama and Sattva Guna contaminating. Tama Guna and Raja Guna contaminating Sattva Guna becomes <coughs> Avidya. Again, consciousness in association with ignorance is the material cause. In other words, consciousness in association with Tamaguna. Now, what is the efficient cause? What is the intelligent cause of this universe? What makes your heart beat, even though you're not attending to your heart? That's the, the intelligent cause. What makes the birds fly north during winter? What makes the seasons come at their own accord? What makes gravity always be available? What makes the, unit, what makes the earth spin around the sun 365, for 365 days? What is all this intelligence? The answer is... Consciousness associated with a totally pure Maya made of pure Sattva Guna. Remember, Maya is all intelligence. Maya is just because often we think of Maya as this, you know, this power, this woman that's there to delude us. No, from the aspect of Maya, actually, can't say from the aspect, everything is Maya. There is no such thing as impurity because Maya is what? Pure Sattva Guna, pure intelligence, all knowledge and all power. And what is Ishwara? So we're bringing three words, Brahman, 
Maya Ishwara. Get to clarify. What is Brahman? Pure original con you. What is Maya? All power, all knowledge, unmanifested. Maya is Brahman associated with pure sattva guna equals Maya. Brahman plus Maya, Brahman plus sattva guna equals Maya. Maya. Actually, too long. It's Maya. Now, what is Ishwara? When the reflection of Brahman is identified with this pure Sattva Guna, then that becomes Ishwara. So therefore, what is Ishwara? Pure Sattva Guna. That's why we say God is all knowledge, total, absolute all knowing. Now, since Sattva Guna thus is all pure, all knowing and all pure, then that means what? Ishwara is all pure, all knowing. Then Ishwara is thus that, all knowledge and um, total purity. So when we say God, it, it changes your perspective now when you say God. What is God? Just all knowledge, pure Sattva Guna, that's it. He is always macrocosmic only, never microcosmic. He sees everything in its totality. He is the great being whom we sometimes call God or Supreme Lord or Bhagavan. There is no avidya in him. There is only avidya where? In the microcosmic jiva. So therefore, there is no ignorance in God. Therefore, the one Brahman, the one pure original consciousness, associated with Maya, which is what? Pure Sattva, and Avidya, which is Sattva contaminated with Raja and Tamaguna, becomes the material and efficient cause, respectively, of the whole entire creation. Brahman be becomes the creation and this we call we can for clarity Ishwara one becomes the efficient cause and Ishwara two becomes the material cause because remember we say there's only Ishwara all there is is Ishwara but to divide it to make it more clear we have to now include Ishwara is what both the material cause and the efficient cause so therefore for clarity Ishwara 1 is efficient cause and Ishwara 2 is material cause. But they're actually what? One and the same Ishwara. No, don't go with these two guys now. I'm just putting it for clarity. Therefore, as this Prakriti, that means this power in Brahman, remember Prakriti means the three Gunas, as these three Gunas or this Prakriti is Maya, <coughs> And Avidya seen as one, in other words, is Ishwara 1 and Ishwara 2 seen as one. So also Ishwara is Ishwara 1 and Ishwara 2 seen as one. Okay? So he is the creator as Ishwara 1 and the created as Ishwara 2. In summary, I already know this confusion, I can feel it. What is Ishwara? Material cause and efficient cause. Period. That's all there is to it. Now, as... No. And we use an example, actually, to demonstrate how uh, God can be both the efficient cause and the material cause. We first use a spider. The spider is both, what? The efficient cause and the material cause of the web. The spider makes the web. That means the web, the creation comes out of whom? Of the creator. The spider, of the creator, of the spider. And also, the spider's intellect also made this, the creation, yeah. made, this, made the web. So therefore, the spider 
is comparing the data to Ishwa, who is both what the material cause, that means of the web, of the universe, and the efficient cause that puts the universe intelligently working together in harmony. And we also use a second case like dreaming. In the dream, not only is the dreamer responsible for the material of the dream, what does the material of the dream come from? The mind. Of you. Yeah. And where this, this intelligently put world in the dream, where does that come from? Yeah. In you, from you. So you are both what? The creator and the, and the created of the entire dream world. Yes. In the same way, Brahman is the creator and the created of the entire world that we dream characters are experiencing right now, speaking about the total. So, all of this understanding is what Tat is referring to. That. See, it's not just a matter of saying that. <laughs> I guess so let's put this into context. So that is simply referring to original Brahman consciousness, which is apparently conditioned by Sattva Guna and Raja Tama Guna. And we are when we say that, what are we doing? We're going through all of that knowledge and arriving where? Brahman. We're not ignoring. And I'm not saying now go over there, I'm just using examples, gestures. Now, what does Twam mean? You. you. There's more to it, of course. Okay, Twam. In other words, the, the, it's a desirous Jiva. Who is Twam referring to? To the Jiva full of desires, contaminated by Rajaguna and Tamaguna, in summary. Okay, verse, when the Supreme Brahman superimposes on itself a Vidya, what is a Vidya? Tamaguna and Rajaguna, contaminating Sattva Guna. Then it creates desires and activities in it. Then it is referred to as Twam. That means it's now created a Jiva. So what is a jiva? A result of a vidya. What is a vidya? Rajaguna, tamaguna, contaminating sattvaguna. So this means a jiva is someone who has very little sattva. Okay, commentaries. Twam or uh, thou? Thou. Thou. Okay. Twam or thou is the individual ignorant jiva that is subjected to ignorance. The result of being subjected and not free is that the soul, that means jiva atma, so now you know when the word, we use the word soul in Vedanta, we're referring to the traveling agent, the soul which takes on new bodies, the ignorant person who dies and then becomes a new body. So what does the soul word mean? Jiva atma. So, the result is that Jivatma has to endure numerous desires unfulfilled. That's our experience on earth. We've got so many desires we want to fulfill. The lack of fulfillment through objects is seen or is proven by the fact, how? That we are doing everything in our life to gain the object of our desire. Desires lead one into karma, and the result of that is desires lead into actions, actions lead into gaining the fruits of actions, enjoying those actions, and that motivates me to what? Continue doing more actions so I can continue enjoying more, and then when I die, in order to continue enjoying, I need a new body, and then that new body is available to continue doing new actions to continue enjoying more. So therefore, this is an eternal cycle. Now, that Brahman, still pure consciousness, upon which in the previous verse we superimposed omniscience, all purity and wisdom and omnipotence of the microcosmic proportions that is Tat, 
on that same Brahman is now superimposed subjectivity, limited knowledge, smallness, delusion, and impurities of the microcosmic jiva in the form of desires and activities. So, Brahman is, is superimposed by what? Sattva guna, that becomes all-knowing, Ishwara. Onto Brahman is superimposed Raja and Tamaguna, that becomes the small limited Jiva. But what's, what's the common factor? They're both superimposed onto one same consciousness. This, the superimposition, the content is different. One is more Sattva, that's why it's all knowledge. So God is all knowledge, but Jiva is limited knowledge. But the point is God is made out of what? Sattva Guna. And the Jiva is made out of what? Raja and Tam. Of course it's Sattva, but it's a lot less. So this means what? These three Gunas are negatable. Therefore, even the word Ishwara becomes unreal. We'll talk about this later in Bhagavad Gita chapter 13. For now, I'll just keep it down because if you say that God is unreal, you'll be like, how dare you say that? <laughs> Oops, did I just say that? <laughs> so this means even Ishwara has to be negated. Okay. <clears throat> so in other words, there are two diametrically opposing sets of attributes are identified with the same pure consciousness. On the first hand, the, the, the tat is what? All pure sattva superimposed onto Brahman. Now we've got ignorance superimposed onto Brahman. You remove sattva and you remove <coughs> rajas and tamas, you pure Brahman. And that Brahman you are. Now what's next? And then we'll... <clears throat> Ten more minutes, okay? Now the significance of asi is explained in a logical manner. First of all, <coughs> what is tat? Explain very quickly. Tat. Tat. A little bit more. <laughs> Excellent. And Tuam? You. More? Who is chewing, grabbing, wanting more, more, more? Eating experiences. Okay. But both what? The Jiva, the essence of the Jiva is Brahman. The essence of the entire all knowing Ishwara is Brahman. Okay. Now, Asi. In summary, what it's going to say is Asi is the one same Brahman, light shining on Tat, which is pure Sattva, and the one same Brahman, you, we're talking about you, not some Brahman out there, is Twam. Raja, Tama, in other words, mixture of Raja, Guna, and Tama, Guna. Now, verse. With the rejection of, if you don't like rejection, with the, what's your word? With the negation of the threefold prakriti, which is sattva, raja, and tamaguna, which produces all the mutual contradictions, the world of duality. I don't like you, you don't like me, I think this is good, I think that is good, this is better, that is better, so on. It's constant uh, duality, contradictions, arguments. All of this is a result of these three gunas. The indivisible Satchit Ananda Brahman alone remains in both Tat and Twam. This is indicated by Tat Twamasi. Now, commentaries. Okay. Okay, we'll read this because it's quite important. With the rejection of the threefold Prakriti, the literal meaning of Asi, Asi relates to the conditionings of Ishwara and Jiva. That means what? That are and you are. That are-ness relates to the apparent conditioning of the one same consciousness. Okay. Now the Upadis, that means these, uh, these Gunas, these three Gunas, are the medium through which the light of Brahman is reflected. Okay, for example, to reflect this light, imagine this light is consciousness. In order to see that this wall, suppose this wall is rough. To see that this wall is rough, I need what? The light. 
In other words, because, and now imagine this roughness indicates tamaguna. And if there was like softness and there was, you know, like very like marvelous and shiny, that would indicate sattva guna. So the one same light is shining on the upadi, the medium through which the light of Brahman is reflected. The upadis in both cases are made up of various combinations of the three gunas. Just like the swall is made up of three different, let's say, um, cement. Water. Um, uh, water. Give me two more. Huh? Water. water and paint. Okay, so they make up what we call wall. In this, and what's shining on this wall? Light. The one same unaffected light which you are. Now, tat. In Ishwara, the body is all sattva. That means Ishwara is all sattva. And it is absolutely pure. So therefore, there's no ignorance and contamination upon Ishwara. And Twam, in the case of the Jiva, because Twam refers to the Jiva, his or her body, that means both your subtle and your gross body, is a mixture of Raja and Tama, Guna and very little Sattva. So this is what Twam is referring to. It's not referring to ignorance, it's referring to the fact that the Jiva is conditioned, but the, the truth of the Jiva is original light of Brahman. Or just Brahman, we can't even say light because that's a reflection. And now Asi, the indivisible Satchit Ananda Brahman alone remains in both that and thou. When all guna related considerations are dropped, that means all three gunas, the only principle left is Satchit Ananda Brahman, you, us, I, self, or pure consciousness, the light of Brahman which the Upadi is reflecting. <coughs> so in other words, the Upadi is reflecting our bodies and we get identified with our bodies. But the truth is we are aware of our bodies. Why? Because you, Brahman, are shining on the body called whatever your name is. And that's called awareness. An example to grasp this. Imagine you are standing in the center of the ocean as a person, as a jiva. And, okay, we'll just draw an infinite ocean like this. And there is a jiva. Now, now this is all water, okay? And it says, draw a little circle around you as a jiva and to indicate the, the, the size of the jiva and draw a circle on the horizon to indicate the ocean. That means it's an infinite circle, right? Because you can't give ocean a circle. Now, what happens when the water dries up? Is there jiva? Mm. Is there ocean? Mm -hmm. So in other words, what's the common principle? The one saying, water. So there's no essential difference between Ishwara, the whole ocean, and the jiva, one single wave and that therefore you can't say now i am the wave and i am the ocean you're neither you're the water because of which ishwara gets to borrow its it gets to exist and the jiva gets to exist this means ishwara depends on Raman. you don't depend on ishwara ishwara depends on you but that's very tricky to say that because to say you it already becomes um kind of a drop and the ocean are same yeah. Okay. So the ultimate conclusion is like this. Maybe it's not the ultimate, but just the conclusion. The light of Brahman falling on both the Upadis, meaning that of the Ishwara, the ocean and the Jiva, the single wave, is the same. Now there is no contradiction. The sentence makes sense. So the implied meaning is accepted as the supreme Brahman. 47, wow, 48. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's good because we start with the Asi. Uh, so next fortnight we will continue. It's going to give us a little bit more examples to grasp the Statwam Asi. So the takeaway message is you're already, you're, you will never away from yourself, nor have, will you ever be. So this means um, when there's a death, 
process happening very soon, <laughs> then there's nothing to worry about because you know there's no sense of going out of existence. So this means that if you're now thinking, yeah, but I'm not enlightened. <laughs> what have you just done? Identified with Vijnana Maya Kosha, therefore what do you do? Reject that thought. <laughs> Okay, so this is how we get tricked. Yes. Oh, I'm sitting here, you know, trying to get this. It's all what? It's all part of the five pancha kosha. Reject. So this is what I mean. The process becomes, when you go out into the world, as we already are in the world, proactively, dynamically rejecting any kind of thought, whether one's liberated or not. It's got nothing to do with you. Pure consciousness, which is aware whether this mind believes it's ignorant or whether this mind likes to enjoy that it's knowledgeable. It doesn't matter. It's all just pancha kosha stuff. Keep rejecting, keep um, uh, negating it until the presence <coughs> is very firm. That's your homework for the rest of your life. I'll just put it up. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Shishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Shanti.